so so uh intro so we so you give an intro and then we uh start by telling some more things about optics i guess or that's correct yeah something like that but what i meant to say was the second individual with you we will have her do her intro ah, that's okay and you have to introduce <laughs> yourself <laughs> cool yeah that's good yeah hey manish hey everybody thanks for connecting uh let's wait for a few more minutes uh while people are joining in and then while we usually do that if there are any other uh new mentors that are connecting today that haven't had the chance to introduce uh, themselves. Actually, yeah, maybe Benedict, can you start with the, the second person who's joining you today? Sure, yeah, so can I introduce you, Barbara Marshikova? <laughs> hey, Barbara, Sorry. could you introduce yourself to everybody? Oh, I love it. Uh, <laughs> hello, everybody, I'm Barbara. I'm a PhD student and a colleague of Benedict, and I also work on the UC2 project, particularly on bringing it into education. Yes, that's what I do. Yeah, yeah. she's um, genius. Uh, <laughs> she's supporting me now, so otherwise I would probably just not survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is what happens with many open source projects is that they, they have a tendency to grow quickly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. Uh, let's just wait. A, a minute or two more. And while we are doing that, just some few logistics. Uh, I'll set up office hours for this week. So on Discord, I'll post a whole bunch of office hours for one-to-one -one meetings this week, primarily on all the teams. And uh, Tyler, have we received a picture from everybody and a link to the Notion page for all the projects yet? Uh, we have lots of them. Um, there are still missing some, um, but I think those people have messaged me. So we should be almost set to go, we can at least get started putting them on the site. Yeah, so just as a background on this, uh, you know, once we launch the course, of course, all of you are engaged and we're actively trying to think about these problems, but there is a lot of people on the sidelines also watching, excited to engage once they know what we are working on. So we'll be putting together on the Frugal Science website a portion of the idea board with the team members that are involved and the mentors that are involved for each one of these projects. So just share one image and a very short description of the group. And we will post that online uh, on the Frugal Science website. Of course, uh, eventually each one of those links would lead to the Notion page, which would be the final page we will be using for documenting all the work in the class. So just keep in mind, uh, we should put together the Notion pages. They should just all be based on the presentations that you've already made, uh, but we will use Notion as the primary lab notebook. And then send a single image uh, and a project name so that we can list that as an idea board. Primarily, this is a way of also recruiting more mentors to the project as well. Uh, and also just keeping, you all will get a chance in one single place to also see what everyone else is working on and doing. Uh, because, you know, as you'll keep following, now we will transition a lot to just much more project specific meetings that will happen in subgroups. And the goal of this page would be is to enable everybody else to follow threads and leads uh, from other groups as well. And I can um, post that link to that form. I can post that again uh, on the Discord immediately following this. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's get started. Today is going to be a much more of a demo type of a day. Uh, so we can get started unless there was any other new mentor that has joined and that have not been part of the prior classes or introductions before. Mm -hmm. So if not, Benedict, I'll pass it to you. Let's start with, uh, I think what we'll do is probably the first hour we will focus on a class of demos and that Benedict has been working on. And then maybe the last half an hour, I'll spend a little bit on uh, fold scope and breaking it apart to get an intuition for the history behind that project as well. But Benedict, let's start with you. Sure, let me quickly start, uh, share my screen. So um, Tyler, just uh, as a question, so we have two different cameras, so probably both with the same name, perfect. All right. So you should all see my screen, I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. 
Great. So, um, well, I will skip the first bit because I gave a rough introduction already last week. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, what is frugal optics? So last week I was um, already introducing that um, in terms of microscopy so that I see that as a bridge between uh, <laughs> the good and the bad worlds. It's probably not entirely true, but I think uh, microscopy is majorly used by nowadays medicine, biology, research and stuff. And uh, industry is more like uh, well, very productive and not really taking care too much about open source. But I think microscopy bridges that quite well. The problem is usually that especially, um, well, sophisticated setups are very complicated to use. And so there's a kind of a black box, which is not really easy to, to, to grasp. And I think many people, since I have lots of feedback from people uh, from the audience, um, it's not so intuitive how to use microscopes and, and not uh, to talk about how to build them. But I think in general, it's not that complicated. Um, but nevertheless, there's a gap between the people who actually want to use it and those who build it. And I think with the proper tools, um, there is some way to circumvent that. And right now I want to focus on yeah, how to build microscopes and therefore we definitely need some, some tools here. And um, yeah, so I think we, we start with uh, the principle about um, yeah, what is light and what's uh, optics in general and how can we arrange them so that it becomes a microscope. And yeah, let's just directly dive in. So what is light? Um, basically starting with the principle of light. Light is um, basically a wave uh, or a particle that I will um, focus on waves today. And what's, what you see here on the right hand side is basically kind of the projection what you would see if you throw in a stone into um, a water basin. And what happens there is like waves um, traveling from the center. So concentric waves like going out um, and that happens in time. So if you observe um, the particles, they will always stay at the same position, but the energy, that's the most important thing, will travel um, outside of the space here. And that's what you see here on the right hand side. So you have some particle eventually, um, for example, which is pumping a field. So it's uh, oscillating, for example, and what's happening there is that uh, waves are spreading in all directions. And um, you can simplify that. Uh, if you um, I think now, so there's uh, waves which have maxima. Now we think uh, wave in terms of a uh, sinusoidal wave and minima. So we uh, visualize that with the uh, green concentrics here or circles, that's the maxima. And the blue one here is the minima. And so they have a distance between the green, the first green and the second green. People call that wavelengths. That's like one period where you again see the same copy of the wave again. And the whole wave equation here can be solved with, for example, a sinusoidal. So if you take um, one line here along the red arrow and you um, print the profile, you see the sinusoidal and you can find that here in the very nice uh, formula. So it's basically really reducing uh, to a sinusoidal with some direction. Uh, so it's along one, it's called usually K vector along an X coordinate uh, with some frequency coordinate. So you have the lambda here with uh, which it's moving over time. And this phi here is basically uh, defined by the shift of the sinusoidal around the zero here of uh, yeah, along X basically. Then you eventually scale that. So if you have a very strong laser, you eventually see a very strong sinusoidal wave here. That's this Y zero. And eventually you can also add a constant, um, for example, if you have some background uh, around you, like daylight or so. And so if we go a little bit more into detail in this formula here, um, I think many people of you already know this phenomena. It's called colors. And the color phenomena is um, very easy to see. Um, so that's basically this lambda. And so if you uh, know this, uh, chart here, uh, it's basically well, representing the spectrum of wavelength and usually you start with high energetic um, UV, which we cannot see unfortunately, but it's kind of, kind of uh, violet and then blue, and then you go over the red, yellowish, over to the red, so that's like the high, um, um, yeah, the large um, lambda uh, wavelength, and what Barbara shows you now is basically a phenomena called diffraction um, that should be visible in the secondary camera with my same name. 
and that's um, something we will see how this works later. But you can see in the center, there is something which is white. And on the uh, left and right hand side, you see the spectra. So even though you assume that, for example, the sun is light, it's basically a summation of different colors. So many, many different wavelengths are superposed. That's something I will get into uh, a little bit more detail later. And then you can basically uh, unmix them with uh, uh, yeah, um, a device which is called a grating. Right, and then you have something which I was, uh, was just telling you is the phase. So you have the, the same um, uh, wave here. It's just a copy, but it's a little bit shifted. So if you compare uh, the maxima here with the maxima here, it's shifted by some um, delta uh, lambda, and this is usually called uh, a phase or a phi, for example. Uh, this is also visible in microscopy, which I'm going to a little bit later. Right, so, but sometimes you want to um, see waves not only as, uh, or light not only as waves, but also at, uh, in terms of rays. So a ray is basically a very nice representation of light because um, it can be, uh, yeah, you can draw it in terms of rays here. And um, the easiest way to represent that or to see that is, for example, if you take a laser pointer, for example, if you have a oh. pointer into your Benedict, presenter. Yes. Benedict, there is a question. Is there a second camera people should also be looking at at the same time? Um, yes. So I think Tyler should know. So the, it's the same um, name. What's the name it's of also, that screen? So currently also, we have the slides. We have you. But is there a second camera? I don't see the second camera. Yeah, so um, I just tried to spotlight it. Um, I'm not sure. If it... Okay, now I see it. Once you have spotlighted it, now it's visible. So just okay. everybody, okay. there are two Benedicts. Then we, okay, then we re repeat the first experiment again. Yes, is because that, nobody uh, saw that. Yes. Sorry about so that. We, no worries. Never mind. And so we start. So it's a simple torch, like you have in your cell phone, for example. And you see that there's white light in the center. And on the right hand side and left hand side, you see the frequency components of your light. So it's uh, basically uh, this little bit here. So you can disperse the light, even though it's white, into different color channels. How this works, I will tell you later. And uh, when we talk about rays, we can um, simplify that uh, or see that with, for example, uh, a laser. Lasers um, have the uh, property that light which travels around the source is almost uh, parallel. So you can uh, yeah, basically represent that with a ray. So it, it basically um, has rays which will never uh, coincide again, uh, very parallel. So another um, uh, very neat thing in terms of ray optics is this camera obscura. Maybe a few of you already have heard of this. So it's um, very simple to, to build at home. You just need a black box <clears throat> with, a, uh, with a, a little pinhole. And how to build that at home, we will quickly show you. So we have a camera. It's a Raspberry Pi camera. So you should see that on the secondary camera. And what we did there, we unmounted the lens. So there's nothing on the camera chip. So it's the bare chip, what you would um, see here. And now Barbara is uh, stitching a small um, hole directly inside the, the camera housing here. And what you can see then is um, basically uh, an image. <clears throat> and so just as a, if people want to see that camera in full screen, you can just click on that video and that stream becomes full screen, which is when you can actually see much more clearly or you can pin the video. <laughs> okay, we have difficulty with the camera. We'll try again. <laughs> anyway. Sorry for that. I think we need to skip and return to this experiment a little bit later. We have problems with the camera. <laughs> anyway, so let's Benedict, continue. You can describe yeah. what you were about to do because with ah. the camera obscura, it's very ah. valuable for people to be able to build it independent of the demo as well. So just That's describe sure. what you were going to do. And lots of people here yes. have Raspberry Pi cameras mm -hmm. and they can implement that. Certainly. So what we just, or what you see there, so it's, um, 
uh, ray optics at its best. So if you have an object, let's say this candle, for example, you really map each part of the candle to a screen. So um, and if you do that for every point of the, the sample here, you have uh, a ray going through this very, very narrow um, pinhole here, and then you form an image on the screen. And the funny thing, of course, is, uh, as you can already grasp it from this image here, it's that it's tilted. So it's flipped. And um, people have done that, um, I think, already in the medieval age, uh, where they were taking images uh, from uh, the landscape so that they were drawing pictures from uh, the camera obscura. And so what Barbara shows you now, so uh, we, we just have um, a UC2 cube with the camera. We removed the, the lens from the Raspberry Pi. And we can just see the lights <laughs> of our office. Yeah, so what you see there now is a very blurred version of the ceiling light of our office. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just because it's very dark here, but you can form images. <laughs> um, and there are, yeah, um, kind of a convolution, I will tell you later about that, um, of your uh, illumination with the pinhole we just stitched into the aluminum foil, which is directly placed on uh, top of the, the sensor. Right, so I'll dive into the next phenomena directly. So it's called light matter interaction. And so, and then just, yes. just one second, Benedict, on this. Uh, as a homework, uh, as people are thinking about images, it's worth thinking about what would be the resolution, for example, of how sharp your image might be using a camera obscura setup. So on Discord and other folks, you should just think a little bit about how large, if you make a large hole versus a small hole, how does it change the quality of the picture? I just want you to all intuitively think about it. Why is it that exactly. you need a true pinhole? That's exactly. Homework assignment. Yeah. Back also, to you, Benedict. Um, think about the terms field of view, the resolution, and then uh, the depths of fields. Mm -hmm. That's also something which is very interesting to think about. Um, right. So I was just talking about light matter interaction. So now uh, maybe you or most of you already have an idea what um, a wave um, in terms of light is, electromagnetic wave. And so if this is hitting an object, of course, there will be some interaction. And uh, this object can be, for example, a sphere, as I just visualized here. Um, and what exactly that could be, I'll tell you later. Um, first thing, well, what we told you is a uh, wave propagates in free space. But what if, is, uh, what if, if there's something in, inside the free space? So for example, a scatra, which is um, an inhomogeneous uh, refractive index distribution. Let's say if you um, have dust in air and then light from sun, for example, is coming to the, the room and then you see the particles there. So that's basically scattering. So the more particles you add to the free space here, um, that's basically uh, visualized here on the left-hand side, uh, the more scattering you have. And the funny thing is, so just assume you have light traveling from the left-hand side through your object. So first object just gets bent or diffracted. And the more objects you add, um, the more interaction between these different scatterers you have. And then you can basically say that it's uh, multiple scattering. That's also one thing you see when you, for example, add very coherent light, let's say, for example, from a laser source um, coming to the surface of the uh, of a table, for example, which has some kind of a microstructure. There is some kind of um, um, yeah, multiple, multiple scattering on the surface, uh, which you can see on your eye. So if you, for example, take your laser pointer and move it a little bit and follow the, the pointer on the surface, you see kind of a moving um, structure on the table, and that's the interference of multiple scattered light um, on the surface. So we tried to do that here, but I think the camera uh, dynamic range is not high enough. So you should tr uh, try that out at home and ask yourself why you always see the same pattern on your eye. Right. So the next thing is absorption. Um, I think many of you maybe have done that in childhood. I also love to do that now. Uh, forming animals with your uh, uh, fingers and that's basically just blocking or shadowing light. It's I think very obvious. Um, what's maybe not so obvious is basically that you can only block certain um, components of the light. So if you think about the lambda, one lambda is a, a color, a wavelength, and you can block that. And um, everybody of you uh, have thousands of these little filters which block certain 
different colors uh, selectively. And this filter in, in your camera, for example, a cell phone camera, is called Bayer pattern. It's, um, uh, it's uh, comparable to your eye sensitivity. So you have lots of more uh, green um, pixels, and they basically just block everything but the green so that you have all the green components transmitted. So this is the transmission rate of your pixel here. And this is the wavelengths. And then you transmit everything here so that you can distinguish between different colors because uh, it's just well, silicon, what's the base material from your camera cannot distinguish that. And so that's uh, what Barbara shows you on the camera right now. So we have a kind of a special filter. Um, and the special filter here, I hope the auto white balance from our camera here is um, playing with us. Um, the special filter has different, um, uh, yeah, different spectra here at different angles. So that's called the dichroic mirror. I think that's something uh, very interesting that um, the spectrum of the filter changes at the incident angle. And I think that's something you should definitely uh, look into because we uh, use that also later for fluorescent uh, imaging in the microscope. So right. just, just a quick bit of uh, kind of uh, uh, comments on the, I'm curious on the bare pattern side of the filters, if anybody in the group knows how these filter matrices are made. Uh, you know, because what, what Benedict is showing is single pixels. The square grid that you see is literally the size of the pixel. So that's very, very small. So mm -hmm. I'm just curious if anybody in the community knows the manufacturing process for making these checker patterns. This is a genuine question. I actually, uh, although I've used these checkered pattern for so many years, uh, exactly. I'm so, scratching so, my head of how they are manufactured. So I don't know whether you can see that here. So that's, um, that's a, um, a sensor here. We hold right in front of the other camera. Yeah, uh, it flashes the rainbow color right there. Right, so I don't know whether you can see that, but uh, yeah, that's basically the diffraction, what you see there. But on side there, it's like billions of, not billions, but millions of pixels and everybody there is unfortunately covered with a color filter. For microscopy, that's not very nice. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but I was just curious, does anybody know the answer to how these are built, manufactured? Benedict, do you know? Manish, uh, Fabian? So I think it's an additive process. Um, what you well, you uh, have masks, and then you have photoresist, and then you apply them sequentially for each different color. So <laughs> right now we try to remove them. So there's I think two different strategies um, with positive and negative photoresist. Um, so either you etch it away or you edit, and um, we right now try to find out which is which. <laughs> but then so the photoresist it's itself is has the correct dyes in it, chemical dyes to give it mm. a filter? Yes. I see. There are two, yeah, exactly. So if you look up for positive and negative photoresist for the color filters, I think then you will find it. There are two different versions, for, also for the two different Raspberry Pi cameras. <laughs> right, yeah, so. If anybody knows a process for safely removing those, that would also <laughs> be very valuable sharing in the community. That, that's indeed very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Right, so I'm directly heading over to reflection. So I think everybody of you knows, um, well, uh, at least I'm when, when I'm in the bathroom in the morning, I'm look, looking to the mirror and then I see myself in, in the mirror. So it's basically just, um, well, in terms of ray optics, ray is hitting a mirror and directly reflecting. And people have done very fancy things. For example, in Chicago, you see the bean where they entirely coated it with a chrome. And um, in, in London, there's a skyscraper even uh, built the way that you have a focus, which unfortunately sometimes um, starts melting some cars. So you can also focus um, light and you can also uh, create optics with um, reflections. So for example, um, if you go to your cell phone, nowadays they use some, I don't know, 40 nanometer uh, processing to manufacture the chip. You can ask yourself, what does it mean? So um, Cell phones, for example, they have microchips which are so integrated that you need to pack so many different um, um, information uh, in silicon. And nowadays, uh, light wavelength, uh, which governs the resolution of this process, is uh, not short enough. 
and therefore they use um, UV light, for example. And fortunately, UV light cannot transmit uh, can, cannot be transmitted through lenses, and therefore you can use mirrors. So mirrors are very important nowadays for producing microchips, right? And talking about lenses, I'm di directly um, heading over to refraction, and refraction is um, the phenomena. Um, of just on that note, uh, I just want to mention something on the uh, mirror side of the story. I know the Operation Moonwatch team is starting to think about a low-cost telescope, which we'll be discussing soon. But remember, sometimes the manufacturing processes for mirrors can be easier because it's one surface. And so there are several telescope designs early on that were built primarily using mirrors for the reason that the technologies for making mirrors were better at that time. Lenses followed up. So and there's many clever reasons for why mirrors can be used. And especially, yeah. of course, there is a big, not so big, but uh, a passionate community of microscopists that primarily want to use mirrors for their optics, which is exactly. an obscure space in microscopy. Exactly, especially if it comes to short wavelengths like UV, exactly. um, you definitely want to use mirrors. <laughs> uh, right, but well, our microscopes are majorly made out of plastics or uh, also glass, so refraction is important. And that's, as I said, the, um, yeah, the phenomena of uh, well, light hitting an inter uh, interface. An interface can be, for example, two different materials where you have, um, well, light coming from air to a glass surface. And um, the, the light is traveling either faster or slower in a different media. And this is governed by the refractive index. So that's a property of the material. And what you can see here, so that's like the wave with the maxima and uh, minima um, hitting a surface. And then you see that the wavelength here is much uh, higher than here. So it's shortened. So it's it still needs well. It needs to preserve energy, and therefore it need it needs to um, shorten uh, the wavelength, and therefore it bends. So you see a change of um, uh, yeah the direction of the ray, and you can of course calculate that with Snell's law. And it's quite funny because light always knows the the fastest way because that's kind of a mathematical optimization problem even though there's no computational overload. So it would be fun to think about it, whether there's any chance to use that for supercomputers. Uh, so it, since it always finds the fastest way. Right, and people use that, as I said last week, um, in communication um, in a slightly different way. So then it's called total internal reflection. Sure. Um, and that's the reason. Uh, so the reason is when you see, okay, there's a sinus and the sinus on the other side. And um, at one point, if you have um, one angle given, for example, it eventually uh, does not give you a number anymore because the aqueous sign is not uh, a real number. And then you are in the regime where the light is not going through this direction anymore. So then you eventually hit the critical angle. And then at one point you hit the total internal reflection angle. So that means that the light comes and it perfectly is reflected at this very interface. And um, perfectly reflected means like there is basically no loss, even though you have light which is hitting the surface and also kind of looking into the surface. And this region here is called, uh, yeah, tur region or um, also the evanescent field. So it's it's damping into the the field here, um, and you can use that for example for uh, total internal reflection uh, microscopy. Um, oh, sorry, I was a little bit too fast. And so that is something we use for this um, uh, microscope. Called, uh, yeah, may maybe a few of you know, it's called Cellstorm 2. And what we use so, here- Benedict, is just before that, let's go back to that demo for a second on yeah. the total ah, internal sorry. reflection. Yeah, just yeah. describe what people should be seeing there. Ah, of course, yeah. Um, I'm very sorry. So yeah, what we see here is... Um, yeah, I'm just trying to slow you down a little bit because I want to cover most of these things <laughs> in depth. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Barbara, would you mind to tell something? What do you see there? Yeah, Barbara, can you talk about what should people be seeing when you turn the laser on? Sure. Can you hear me from we here? We can hear you. Very good. So basically, as Benedict was showing, uh, when the laser hits the surface, he can see reflection, not for the zero angle, 
but anywhere after the D more correct, even though it might not be that easy to see. And also, I hope you can see that once it's inside, it also reflects. And eventually, we should be able to reach an angle where it only reflects inside and doesn't get out in that direction. But I would probably need a third hand to actually hold it still in that. What? Oh, yeah, that might help. So. Yeah, so does everybody see the angle depending on the reflection? Now it doesn't get reflection. out on this side. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, if, you, if you observe, so if you go a little bit up here, you, you see a little bit going through the prism. So here you see some, oh, my speaker's in the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> too, too few hands. Uh, 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 uh. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so so you can use that for uh, for example metrology, which is very cool. Yeah. <laughs> right. You also mount it for that case. Yeah, exactly. And people use that tr to transfer information across um, the world because uh, there's basically not much loss involved. It's only the material which is eventually scattering uh, information. And we use that in our lab um, to image cells uh, in turf. So what you do is you couple light into a very thin optical waveguide, as you see that here. And cells are grown on top, and then you observe them from the top, and they are illuminate, illuminated from this evanescent field. That gives you very uh, thin sections of your sample, basically. Right, and talking about the refractive index, so this experiment I would really like to do. Unfortunately, we don't have an aquarium here, uh, but there's some fun from Laura Wallace's page here. Um, so if you have an aquarium at home and you so just take a laser. Hmm? Just one comment, Benedict, uh, going back one slide. I think I wanted to make two comments. First of all, mm -hmm. everybody noticed that Barbara has a laser pointer point connected in the cube. And many of you use laser pointers all the time. Uh, just please do remember as you are starting to play with this beautiful piece of frugal optics that eyes have to be protected. Oh, yeah. And so, Lovely. you know, with Benedict, Barbara, we, we work with people who work with lasers for a long time. You really learn certain important skills. So maybe very important if you're ever playing with lasers is to please remove your uh, rings yeah. because they bounce. Uh, and then the other one would be is identifying the correct uh, safety eyewear. Mm. So just it's it's very important uh, because you only have two eyes, and uh, any laser damage is actually a serious uh, challenge. And so as many of you think about laser pointers, many laser pointers nowadays you can get uh, that are way too powerful. So please be. Uh, very careful whenever you are using a laser pointer, even casually as well. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that, Benedict. Back to you. That's that's very important. Exactly. Also, make sure that the um, uh, the laser class is somewhat below uh, something which can damage your eyes. So it probably um, varies from country to country, but sh should always stay somewhere below five milliwatts. So please be aware that this can forever destroy your eye. Um, yeah. And right. then Manish has a safety tip as well. Uh, Tyler, can you just unmute Manish for this? Uh, yeah, do you want to mention that, Manish, just briefly? Yeah, sure. Uh, what I was saying is, so since most of the experiments you will find laser is not intense, maybe you will turn off lights and that makes it more dangerous situation for you because your eyes will dilate and then more amount of light can get in from laser even in the short exposure time. So be very careful with any laser. And especially if they are cheap laser, as it was being mentioned, that the class which is mentioned on the laser is wrongly mentioned. So it will be mm. much, way more powerful than what actually it is supposed to be. So mm. although it may say one milliwatt, but it may be 10 milliwatt, which is really dangerous. So yeah. And then also, as, go ahead, Benedict. So now with that we're talking about that. So the green lasers are uh, dangerous in particular because that's uh, it's called frequency doubles. So they start with infrared, which is uh, 1064. They frequency double that to 532 uh, nanometers, and they sometimes don't block the uh, the pump laser, yeah. which is 1064. And even though you cannot see that, it uh, can still damage your eye or something else. So really take care. That's very 
Very, very important. Oh, as one more homework for everybody, I think it would be valuable to see, uh, is there well-documented low-cost laser glasses? So, you know, safety glasses. So wherever you work and think about, see whether there are, uh, is a clear market for students to have access to laser safety glasses. And if not, that would actually be a really valuable, worthwhile project as well. Because yes. when we buy them in the lab, of course, they have certification, but just the safety glasses themselves can cost hundreds of dollars. Exactly. Um, yeah, also they need to be certifi uh, certified. So just buying laser glasses doesn't necessarily help you anyway. Mm -hmm. So really make sure that's yeah. a very good comment. Um, yeah, so I continue with the refraction and now we um, head over to another phenomena. Uh, so we start with a, a glass you probably find uh, at home somewhere. It's a, it's a wine glass and it's, it's empty. So if we shine on with a laser, you won't see too much except some uh, yeah, refraction at the uh, spherical edge. And now if we add some water, you can turn this thing into, uh, yeah, into um, a lens. And the reason for that is, well, the, 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 the water has a different uh, refractive index compared to the surrounding air. And um, taking Snell's law um, into account, the, the ray gets uh, bent or refracted at the edge of the spherical surface here. And that means that, uh, well, think of the, the, uh, the surface we had earlier. So it just hits the surface and gets refracted, uh, always taking this law into account. And if you do that for every surface of this um, sp sphere here, which of course would uh, well lead to infinite uh, calculations, it will focus here. And that's what you see here. So each ray here will go through the lens. Uh, the focus here is not quite true because um, there is some uh, shift for each of the, um, the rays here. So they uh, won't interfere in one perfect spot, but that's what uh, a perfect lens would do. So light coming from infinity, visualized here as rays or parallel lines here, they focus into one spot and very important, they will also do the other way around. So starting in one point and they will, um, yeah, will propagate to infinity again. And that's something you can also see if you take a simple lens um, and hold it in your hand or close to the, um, to the surface of the floor and observe um, the image of, your, uh, of the sun. And again, take care because the, the sun is also, even though it's far away, very, a very strong irradiator. So you can start burning stuff and also your eyes. But um, basically the transformation from the sun, which is almost infinity, well, infinitely far away, it focuses into one spot and the distance between um, the, uh, this, the lens to the focal spot is basically one focal length. That's also one thing um, you can see here. So using a lens as a imaging device. So you see that again, uh, Barbara is uh, holding one of our cubes with the lens. He has 40 millimeter focal length. And that's basically the distance from the principal plane. So the uh, reduced, uh, or well, you can simplify any lens into a single uh, line here. Then you assume that it's a thin lens. And um, the, the focal length um, basically describes the point on the optical axis where light, which comes from infinity, focuses. And you can easily um, form an image um, where you uh, have something in the front, for example, um, a transparent image or a photograph, or in our case, it's a microscopic sample, hold by the blue hole that you can see uh, what Barbara is placing there right now. And so you, we illuminate the, the sample here and um, the lens here, which is the red part or the orange part is basically imaging it um, onto a screen. So you see that um, on the screen, that's some um, wing from a uh, uh, fly, I guess. And so you so can Benedict, calculate- Can you play yes. with the saturation of the intensity? The, if you, yeah. So yeah. the image is a little too the bright. Professional tools. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's also another problem with the, the dynamic range of our cameras here. Yeah. Uh, so we place the um, diffuser, so then intensity is getting down a little bit. 
And what you see there is, so we placed the Y here, so that's the object, and you see an image at uh, the distance um, after the lens. And you, you do that by basically following the th three rules here. So you, first one is uh, array coming from infinity, going through uh, the focal plane here or focal spot. And the second one is the other way around, going from the object through the focal point here um, to infinity. And the last one is going through the center of the lens and then you form your image. And you can do that trick also with a negative lens. And I think that's a very good example, uh, exercise for doing that at home. Uh, how to form images also if there are more um, uh, lenses involved than just one. So you can think about more complicated uh, lens systems. Right, yeah, so Barbara is holding now a negative lens. So maybe you can ask yourself the question, uh, yeah, how imaging is performed there. Mm -hmm. Right, so, and um, yeah, lenses, they are probably used for many, many years already as a magnifying glass. And um, so the, the principle is, um, well, relatively simple. So assuming your eye is also um, a lens, that means if you have something in the focus of your lens, the lens will automatically transform that into infinity and your eye will then refocus the light which comes from infinity onto the retina. And then depending on the distance between the object to the lens, you will um, then vary the magnification. For example, if you place that uh, a little bit closer to the lens, so um, if the object is closer to the lens rather than the focal length, then you have divergent beams and then you magnify your image. And um, another optical... Um, mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. All good? All perfect. So, and um, another thing, uh, I think I already talked about that last week already, is a um, very simple uh, optical instrument. It's called the telescope. So people on the sea already so use it. Just a quick question, Benedict, on the, before we... Can you say a word about the the couplers that are currently holding the lenses in the cubes? Yeah. Um, um, yeah. yeah just just a something. word about uh, is that also snappable? Does that come yeah. off? So is actually, there a way to break so you can show people the cube in its entirety? Yeah. So actually, I can even. Mm -hmm. I, I need a bit of strength. I can open the cube. And we have lens holders uh, that are designed in OpenSCAD and they're completely parametric. You can also find the design on Thingiverse where you just put in your diameter and thickness of the lens and put in the holder for it. The latest version also prints the name, so the focal length of it. It just has a simple ring that holds the lens inside and the insert fits in the cube. And you can also then shift it inside so you adjust its position and focus. Perfect. But I need <laughs> both hands to close right. it again. And so maybe eventually people are getting a little bit confused because we have now two different yeah. versions. Um, what you see here is now the injection mode version, um, which cannot be printed, but um, we made it that way that it's compatible. So that's something you eventually will find on GitHub and also in our recent publication. And this is done magnetically. So you have some uh, ball magnets and some screws. Those need to be ferromagnetic. You just snap them onto the surface and then they will uh, stick there forever. So you can make 3D uh, setups. And the three different parts look a little bit different. So it's not symmetric. So you have lit and you have um, the base. And so you put them together by, again, some screws. So then it looks like this here. But it has the, the same dimensions here. It's just that this one here is injection molded with like this Lego mechanism. And this one has um, the, yeah, the Lego magnetic magnet. feature. Yeah, but the inserts still fit in all of them. So uh, you can you can build this one at home or get injection molded cubes and just bring the inserts sort of. Exactly. That's the idea. <laughs> and the injection molded stuff was just for scaling it up a little bit and also for precision. So the injection molding is comparable to Thor Labs, I would say. Um, also still very recent. Uh, yes. The current design has a degree of freedom that the lens position inside the cube uh, 
the user has the chance to be able to move it, right? Yes, exactly. So there is um, a bearing of some kind that it moves it on. Yeah. Yeah, back and forth uh, within the cube. But it's always on the optical axis. So all, all our components are always on one axis. So exactly. Right. So this is another example. So the, the outer um, diameter or uh, the outer dimensions have to be always the same. So I will um, quickly jump into this when we have some time. Um, and we have a modular developer kit we call so that people can just use the dimensions and put whatever they want in there. So this is, for example, um, it's a movable XY positioner. Uh, here we have some uh, auto alignment tools. So um, it, it makes it possible to shift it along the optical axis, basically. And it's also point symmetric so that you can um, move that in all directions. Mm -hmm. And then everybody, I don't know if you all saw the geometry, there was already a compliance structure in that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, cool. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I'll just continue with the simple exper um, simple optical devices here. So this is the telescope, which basically uh, alters the, the well the um, the yeah the the size of an object. For example, if you have a, a tree far away, it's getting down converted with a secondary lens here, and you see already that it focuses and then it um, well um, propagates that to infinity again, and then you. Um, see an image um, through your eye, which is then, uh, well, rotated, but also you see an image which is, um, well, larger, because the object appears larger. Well, and in microscopy, <clears throat> it's actually the other way around. So if you compare the two slides here, here the, the large focal length here comes first, and then the smaller one comes second. And in microscopy, it's the smaller, um, focal length comes first, so you place your object somewhere in the focal length of your uh, first lens, and then it's getting propagated to infinity. And then the secondary lens basically magnifies that so that it um, appears larger. All right. So I go over to the next phenomena. So that's diffraction, and I hope that we <laughs> still have some time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, we have time. I think okay. yeah, it's valuable cool. to actually take the time and finish this. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, so diffraction. Yeah, don't rush anything, it's okay. I'll Ooh. push the fold scope stuff to the next week. Mm -hmm. So, the, the um, interference is also a very nice phenomena again for uh, the wave terminology. And it's really simple or simply taking one wave and add it to a second wave. And um, what you then see is okay, I have one wave here, I have one wave there. And everywhere where I have two waves interfering, so for example, two maxima um, um, adding up to an even higher maxima, I have uh, a superposition with a higher uh, amplitude, so to say. And that's something you can see here. So the first wave remains stationary. The second wave um, experiences a phase difference. So you just move it. And this here represents wave one plus wave two. And you already see that in certain um, moments, you have a zero wave. That means the intensity <clears throat> is zero. And um, well, you, if, you, oops, if you move your uh, wave over the other, you get some very fancy thing. It's called a moving more ray effect. And that's also something um, Barbara shows you now. So we have one object, which is um, a grating. So that's one wave here. And we have another. Uh, object which is uh, not quite a grating, but it's a, uh, it's, uh, a photograph which we put into a grating. And what you see now, probably, is um, I don't know whether there's aliasing, uh, but <laughs> yeah, now we see it. Perfect. So that's the interference of one wave. So maybe if you remove it again, so you don't see anything. It's just a photograph, and uh, the other. Um, uh, foil we put on there. So there's just a grating like this here, like a sinusoidal grating. It's interfering. So you really add up one wave to the other, and then you see the interference pattern. So it's a little bit like when you see a fence and then another fence with a different structure that you see this bouncing effect. And um, so why do I tell you that? <clears throat> well, you can do fun things with it. And um, so we have talked lots of things about uh, plane waves. And once the plane wave is hitting a slit or a small barrier, you can form a spherical wave. 
So it propagates in space, um, again, with the same wavelength and the same phase and everything, but now it's not an infinitely expanded plane wave, but it's a, a point source here. That's very important because just imagine you just, uh, you not take only one point source, but many. So now we ha um, have many, many point sources here. Again, we uh, start with the plane wave. And now you see that each of these little um, dots here, they form uh, a point source. And then you see that they are interfering. So you have plane uh, um, wave one plus wave two plus wave two, uh, three, F, um, et cetera. And what you see here, so if you appreciate that, you see um, a major kind of beam here forming. So that's called the first diffraction order. So you have one portion which goes just through like the plane wave, which is here, as if there is nothing in between. And there is one part which um, is getting kind of deflected. Um, and what's funny is that there's some portion also going down here and that's the minus first diffraction order. So it's um, called diffraction, this phenomena. And diffraction is basically the phenomena what you observe um, if you let a wave propagate through some uh, material which um, is in this, in the, yeah, alters the, um, um, the shape of the initial wave. And what Barbora shows you right now is exactly the, the experiment we have shown here, here um, numerically. So we again put um, uh, a grating there. So it has, um, it, you cannot see that because there's such a fine grating um, that it's only visible by the laser kind of. So we have a laser, the laser forms plane waves. So infinitely uh, expanded um, and uh, hitting this little grating here. And the grating forms many, many, many different um, um, point sources. And the point sources, well, if we were to propagate it to infinity, um, forms an interference pattern, which forms the zeros order. It's, so it's just going through. And the first minus um, first diffraction order. So that's left and right hand side, if you can see that. Maybe you just turn out. Okay. Yeah. Right, I think it's, so you yeah. can see the two beams there. And what's funny is, so, um, that's much better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so if you visualize that again, so we have many, many point sources, they interfere. And once you um, propagate it to kind of infinity, so 10 centimeters um, compared to the 400 uh, nanometers uh, from the wavelengths we use for illumination is already kind of super far away. So almost infinity, you see these different uh, maxima. So these are corresponding to the diffraction orders. And um, the, the points here you find on the screen, um, or at least the, the angle here, which they spread with, they again depend on this lambda here. So the lambda is again the wavelengths of the uh, illuminating um, light source. And the G is basically the, the distance between the holes here. And so if we take another laser, which has even shorter wavelengths, so UV, for example, then you see the lambda, um, it gets uh, smaller here, and so these uh, things here, they get spreaded. So, um, right. Mm -hmm. ah, so we take, sorry, we take a longer wavelengths. So we take the red one and we mark the positions of the maxima here. So the blue versus the red. So now you see the red here. So Barbara is marking the red ones here. And then we turn on the later again, and then you can uh, prove that this formula is valid here. So with the larger wavelengths, the, uh, the lambda is getting larger with the same G and the, the points here are, are spreading. So, and now again, the blue and the, the blue is more in the center. And so now we turn on the light again so to see uh, where we had the, the maxima of the different spots. So, and the, the, the the, the red indeed is um, more separated. So if you think of blue is more around the center and the red is more around the edges here. Right. So, and why is that important for optics? Well, for, um, um, so I need- Waves. Waves, <laughs> right. Um, there's it's this- Spending a little bit time on this, I think what's very valuable is what you just saw as a demonstration. It's extremely important if, because optics has two parts to it. I mean, there is mathematical formulations that you can really very straightforward write down, 
But unless you check these formulas with actual experiment, it almost, there is this sense of magic that it just happens. But it's very valuable that anytime you're making this measurement, like what just Benedict just did, to put these numbers back in. And when it turns out, I mean, of course, you might have known because it was written in a textbook, it's true. But when you actually calculate it yourself, there is a sense of confidence and there is a sense of accomplishment that you get. So it's very important in the frugal optics side, as you're thinking about these sets of experiments, any measurement you make, try to check it with a formula. Uh, and even though you've known forever that this was true, doing it yourself is very satisfying. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you can measure certain aspects of the irregularities and understand something far deeper by just making sure that you do these comparisons. Exactly. That's, that's very true. <laughs> yeah. And then, um, so once you know, the... most new ideas come from when you're trying to just make something and it just doesn't match the formula. And suddenly, you know, you are not accounting for another thing that's happening in parallel. So yeah. it would be very valuable for this week as you are starting to play with optical components. Uh, even if it might look trivial, try doing it yourself. It's worth it. Yeah, and also if you check uh, like all the Nobel Prizes and see how uh, they found their phenomena, I think in many cases it's they say they found it by accident. <laughs> so mm -hmm. uh, stay curious, not just believe what's in the textbook. At least uh, try to to get an idea what it's really meant by that, right? And so with this here, um, we can already directly um, describe uh, resolution in in terms of optics. So uh, we know this here so a lens basically transforms stuff which comes from infinity like a plane wave into a spot and the other way around from a spot to infinity and so we start again with one wave so a point source placed directly inside the focal plane of a lens forms a plane wave and if we now take a second point which we also place inside the focal plane but now a little bit um, further apart from the optical axis it forms uh, a plane wave, but now um, again, think about the the fact that we have to go through the center of the lens. If you uh, well remember image formation of a positive lens, it forms a plane wave under an angle. And the same for wave number three. We start here in the focal plane with a point source, and it forms um, a plane wave. Now the green uh, stripe here. And if you now observe uh, the interference inside the focal plane. Um, of uh, well, right directly behind the lens here, you see that the interference forms, yeah, what, what is it, a grating. So um, it's basically uh, Fourier transforming a pattern from one side to the other. So, well, people may ask, what's a Fourier transform? I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, but what's interesting about optics is that um, sometimes, if, well, if you have this here, you can re image that with a secondary lens. So we have that phenomena here. So, um, okay, now that's a little bit confusing probably. Uh, we, uh, we start with the grating here. Um, it's placed inside the focal length of the lens before the first lens. It forms, well, if you think of the, the other slide here, um, you can just uh, flip, flip this image here, exactly. And what you see here is that we place a grating here and it forms these three spots here we saw in the slide before and then the secondary lens here basically it just re-images so it's the same slide as we see here so it's just this year um, and it re-images the, these three points here so that these three components of the wave here interfere on for example the screen but what if we block it so um, what if we place for example uh, an aperture right inside this plane here so that they cannot go through anymore. And um, that means only the on axis point, so only the plane wave, which is directly going parallel to the um, optical axis is going through and it will do nothing but just produce intensity on your camera. So there's no interference anymore. And there's um, a famous um, guy who actually comes from the city where we are in right now. So Ernst Abbe <laughs> descri described this phenomena. And he described this um, uh, formulation, uh, what's the resolution of optics. Um, and that's quite funny because if you observe this formula here, 
with the, uh, the grating formula here, you eventually see some, um, uh, yeah, some similarities here. So basically, um, you can transfer uh, certain frequencies, it's called, through your system. Um, and then at one point, it will just block it. So depending on the angle you have here going through your system, um, you cannot resolve that anymore. And so you, you can observe that at home. Um, some of you, uh, so, some of you uh, face night time already now. So if you observe star uh, sky now, right now, um, you may think as uh, some of the stars, they look um, bigger. So they appear larger, um, but in fact, it's not true because they are so far away that each of them, they are just point sources. And your eye is basically blocking certain frequencies of these um, um, yeah, spatial information. And all of them appear to be the same size on your retina. And only the fact that they appear to be different sizes that they are um, brighter or darker. You can also suggest our ABBA experiment video on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. So we'll give you a hint on what's the exact um, uh, yeah, correspondence to the optics uh, in terms of Fourier transform uh, later with our UC2 ABBA experiment. And um, I'll tell you um, so maybe- Benedict, just before you go to the next, uh, you very casually mentioned that you're in the same city as yes. uh, the- <laughs> the founder of the Resolution Limit. Could you say a word about the history of that city and just what does it mean uh, um, in that place? <laughs> so- um, Historic context of that. When did that happen? Yeah. Okay. It was handed over to yeah, me. So actually we are in the lovely city of Vienna in Germany, which in terms of optics is considered the center of the world for many people mm -hmm. and uh, around 1860, uh, Ernst Abbe, who was a professor at the university doing physics, met here with a great, uh, how do you call it, manufacturer, mm -hmm. Carl Zeiss, who was very good at making tiny mechanics, but didn't really know about optics. And Abbe decided that they will do it properly. And he calculated how to build a microscope, while Zeiss was able to build the microscope following all these precise uh, um, conditions and thanks to being in Vienna they also met with another guy who was Otto Schott who was actually producing glass and at the time was one of the first who was able to produce glass that was optically clear enough to be good for microscopes of high resolution and thanks to these three guys <laughs> we are now here <laughs> yeah it's like the silicon valley for microscopes <laughs> yes. and then do you know how both of them met how did Zeiss end up meeting the one perfect person that he needed to know to truly crack this. I'm just so, curious, is this a coincidence that two of the I think partially most coincidence, optic, yeah. also the world wasn't that big at the time. <laughs> ah. And up with small. Yeah, so I think Carl Zeiss, they, he built um, like the tripods before that already, mm -hmm. but without good optics and yeah. um, the same other way around. So it's like an art to build a microscope, which is not vibrating. I think, um, uh, yeah. That's really the reason I wanted to highlight this story is for many of you, you know, some of us do things very formally while others start with the act of building and then hone our skills. And this is a great example that both of these things were needed to truly be able to build instruments that change the world. So it really is a beautiful example that, you know, all aspects of skills are extremely important. Many of you are experimentalists, many of you are theorists. Uh, it's very important to, you know, both enjoy both at the same time and actually find uh, folks that you would not talk to otherwise. Yeah, one day, uh, maybe you should upload some photographs from uh, his grave because there's something very special too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if his grave is in the same town. He's, uh, Abe is not buried here, no. size is. But there's the Abbe monument. Yeah, you're right. So this is the yeah, monument yeah. you find directly. In the I wanted center. to mention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you see these stripes here. So that's what he did in his very famous um, paper. And if you, it's funny. So if you read this paper, so it's in German, unfortunately. Um, but I think there are some nice translations somewhere. Uh, you really, he really derives it from an experiment that this formula has to be true. <laughs> I think because he didn't know much about the free transform at the point. 
Mm -hmm. um, but what I would like to, to tell you about Fourier transforms, so I hope it's not too confusing. So uh, if you can see my webcam now, um, so uh, just giving you the very basic example. So uh, Fourier transform is, uh, well, starting with a Fourier series, um, not super complicated, let's say. So if you have an arbitrary signal, let's start with a 1D signal here, um, you can separate that into components which are um, basically sinusoidal uh, with different frequencies here. So you can uh, um, uh, represent this complicated um, amplitude here with uh, sinusoidal one plus some sort of sinusoidal frequency two and three and four and so forth, so forth. And um, maybe a few of you already know that from an audio spectrograph. So depending on the, the frequency I'm using for my voice, I don't know whether you can see that, it's probably not super bright, but um, you see um, a spectrogram and depending on the frequency, like ooh, you see that um, the maximum of the, the frequency synthesis is moving. And so it is for optics. So uh, there's a very nice app I can share. It's called Fourier Filter Cam. And what it does is, um, it can do a free transform, but now in 2D. And if we take a grating, um, it's very cool to see that the free transform of this grating can directly be visualized uh, here. And we can block the frequency components here. So once we go back to real space, you eventually don't see the grating anymore. I have to block it. So that's basically the other experiment you can do digitally. So I can give you more details uh way <laughs> to how to explain that later in the teach me anything if you want yeah. so that's the fun you, thing about optics. That, can you just repeat that experiment one more time sure uh, it's, i think it's not <laughs> super yeah, easy to clear go. for folks yeah oh sorry so what it does so it's just um using the camera um and then it fully transform the image so and if you go back to the slides where uh we have a grating it produces these uh, blobs here. So that's the maxima of the grating here. Uh, and if we block these information here and go back to real space, then the camera can basically not transmit the information. So you cannot see uh, the grating anymore. And now if we turn the, uh, the grating, the, the free spectrum is basically now uh, yeah. oriented perpendicular. And then you uh, see the grating. Mm -hmm. So at one direction, you cannot see it. And in one other direction, you can see that. And that's basically the whole trick about Fourier transforms. And you can do all the math behind it, but Which it's so much so more beautiful fun. because it makes the masking process so tangible. I've exactly. never seen this app, but you can imagine the complexity of the mask that you can put in Fourier space. Exactly. And you can... drawing on it. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's really cool. I can share that. Unfortunately, it's not in the app store anymore. It's from Laura Wallace group. Um, no, right. So... Yeah, we can pull that to see. Right. Yeah, we should put the link for this somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, right, so I'll just go through another phenomena which we didn't tackle uh, yet. So it's called fluorescence. And you can also see that um, very easily <clears throat> if you go to the supermarket um, and uh, get some tonic water. And tonic water has um, something very interesting in it. It's called fluorescing. And um, if you shine on it with, for example, a blue light, so if you go back to the other webcam, um, I hope the camera can resolve that. So we have a blue light and we see um, a, a yellow, um, yellow kind of signal. I don't know whether you can see that. Sorry, one second, okay. Yeah. All right. So again, so the, what Barbara is doing, so she has a the blue laser and she uh, illuminates a bottle filled with tonic water. And what you see, at least in of our office, is that it's entirely yellow. So that's a conversion process um, where you take one wavelength, for example, somewhere in the, uh, in the blue, 400 nanometers, and um, there's an electron inside your, uh, inside your element getting excited, so high, um, higher uh, electron state. Eventually, there is some relaxation inside um, the excited state. And then once it um, relaxes back to the ground state, uh, it emits photons, but with the um, higher wavelengths. And so the shift from uh, shorter wavelengths to higher wavelengths is called Stokes shift. 
And um, so there have been many developments uh, to use that for biology, for example, in the uh, green fluorescent protein. So it's a protein you can uh, add to certain cell structures, for example, or some synthet uh, synthesized dyes, in, um, which are based on uh, rhodamine, for example, in different colors. And with this, you can do very cool uh, fluorescence microscopy. Right. So, and so just before you jump off on the fluorescent side, does anybody know why tonic water has fluorescence? Because, <laughs> why? I mean, uh, I know fluorescein is biologically compatible. We use it in experiments in all kinds of places. But why would they add it in a product that's so <laughs> widely? Because is that advertised or? No, I think it's, it's chinin. Ah, uh, chinin. Sorry, yeah, it's chinin. Chinin in in chinin in general on its own is fluorescent, and because it's in tonic, tonic fluorescent. Flu, flu, fluorescent, yeah. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, but also if you go to uh, to Chicago um, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, they will add lots of fluorescine to the to the water just to make I it see. green. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's yeah. not it's not dangerous, I think. Got it. Good. Dinosaur as well now. Um, so okay, so then let's just go through the next few um, bits. So um, I think many of you were asking me um, what we should do with the optical device. So um, yeah, actually um, the yeah optical discs. So how does it work? So there are different discs around. So compact disc, uh, DVD, and Blu-ray. And as you can appreciate that here, it's uh, they have different um, amounts of data compressed on one of these, one of these disks. And um, so, for example, for a CD, you have 700 megabytes, which is funny because that is uh, according to uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. Uh, DVD, of course, has video data, so it needs to um, hold more data. And Blu-ray has even more. And uh, to put that much uh, content on one uh, um, disk, uh, the information has to be squeezed as um, much as possible to read it out optically. And so the way they do that, you have a, a silver surface and you basically punch hole in that, for example, with uh, a burner, like CD burner. And then you, afterwards you read it out basically like a, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, well, whatever. So you count the, the ones and the zeros uh, bits. And um, well, so um, yeah, the, of course, the smaller um, or the more information you want to put on there, the smaller the structures you want to put there uh, want to be. And um, also the, the, the device which is reading that out later has to be super uh, high quality because the, the dimensions we are talking about here is sub uh, yeah, so submicron, so 250 nanometer for one spot on the Blu-ray, for example. And so the, the optical device, which is reading it out, is really like a lens, which is um, focusing on uh, the CD surface and measuring the back reflection with different wavelengths. So again, talk, I'm thinking about the optical resolution. The smaller the wavelengths, the higher the resolution. And they really um, put it to the very extreme. So you have a very, very good lens here. So that's the pickup device from Blu-ray at a very uh, low uh, wavelength or short wavelength to get maximum information from one disk. And also if you, um, well, got the chance to get one of these optical pickup devices, you can, um, I, well, disassemble one of these devices and see what's in there. It's, really insane what they are able to put in there. So there's a whole auto focusing mechanism in there, which makes sure that the, the, the spot here on, um, inside the disc here is um, the, the very best quality you could achieve so that you get the best optical readout quality. And therefore you have an optical uh, feedback or a, like a loop, which is measured um, with a photo detector, which is actually a quadrant diet. And it um, varies the position of the objective lens here. And so that's something uh, maybe a few of you have already seen that uh, the, the optical pickup device here, uh, as I borrowed it from some slides from a very cool um, frugal approach to use these devices for biohacking. Uh, you can find this link here. Um, 
um, you can move the lens with a voice call. So it's uh, like a speaker, you can move it up and down very precisely, I think somewhere in the nanometer range. Um, and then you have tons of optics, like um, different gratings. They are even holographical gratings, so very hard to produce them. Um, you have dichroic filters, you have uh, different uh, lenses to focus the beam. And also, uh, if you think about the three different lenses, uh, sorry, uh, three different uh, discs like CD, DVD, and Blu ray, you need three different wavelengths, and all of them are combined um, to focus in one single spot within this very tiny um, device here. And it's mass produced, and you can get that for like one to five euro on eBay, for example, for this um, PlayStation 3 device I was talking about. Um, last week, I think. And there's a whole bunch of very crazy stuff they do with this optical pickup device. Um, and all summarized in this paper I highlight, I'm highlighting here. So this hacking CDVDVD for biosensing is very cool. Um, so, so for example, they built a atomic force microscope with it um, where you get really like nanometer uh, resolution with it. Um, and what is also cool about these um, uh, voice call motors is that you can control them easily with current. And um, this here now shows uh, a picture from uh, another lens. It's also apparently um, injection molded from another cell phone lens. Um, and so if you, for example, have the chance to get uh, a second um, lens from a second uh, cell phone, for example, as I hold it in my hands here right now, you can, that, uh, can get that as a spare part for um, some $5 or something, you can get uh, rid of the sensor here easily by just cutting it away. And when you take that, I think I was showing that last week already, you can kind of glue that in front of your uh, actual cell phone so that you end up with a setup which looks like that here. So you have your cell phone, which contains a, a sensor, one imaging uh, optics here. So it's actually assembly of, for example, five different lenses. Uh, and then you take another lens here right in front. It's called the retro optic because you basically mirror the first lens. And then with this, you have a, an optical imaging system, which does one to one or minus one to one imaging. So you have a magnification of roughly one. And um, you ask yourself, well, that's not so much, but since the pixels of your cell phone here are so small, so they are in the range of some microns, you can really resolve stuff with, uh, yeah, within the range of micrometer. So I just show you the super simple setup here um, when you see my webcam. So it's uh, one cell phone and there's one cell phone camera just sticked or glued in front of it. And I think I wanted to show that uh, last week already. So I have one sample here, which is um, a blood sample uh, or a blood smear. So I try to hold that steadily. I think I'm already quite late. So if you appreciate that here, hopefully you can see that, uh, you see the, the single, um, uh, yeah, the blood cells here right now. So, and this whole setup here cost you probably like five euro. Um, of course, assuming that you have a cell phone already and those so, who would like to measure. A, just a comment on this Benedict. So this trick mm -hmm. actually of reverse lens microscopy comes from the photography literature originally. Mm -hmm because there were lots of photographers who just didn't have macro lenses and started using their SLRs with a reverse lens. Exactly. And that sort of led into the, the term people should look for is just reverse lens. And then there are several papers that describe this really nicely. But I found when I learned about the fact that photographers were doing this because of the fact that macro lenses are extremely expensive, but a mm -hmm. traditional lens reversed gives you the same properties as a macro lens. Uh, I found that really remarkable because amateur photographers essentially discovered this uh, while looking at products. Exactly. And um, so one thing where we use this exact configuration in our lab is uh, we built a small stars detector, we call it. So we have fluorescently labeled beads, uh, which are fluorescent if, uh, if there's a patient positively tested and some uh, well negative control where you have no positive um, person. And so you can really do crazy stuff with it. Um, also like uh, very low cost diagnostics. And some of you are already approaching uh, the uh, blood testing regime. So I think this configuration is very handy for you. 
Uh, also, um, for those who have now the Pirates from Blu-ray players, you can replace this lens with your Blu-ray uh, lens as well. The reason is that the, the focal length of these highly optimized lenses is very low. So some three millimeters, for example, same as the one from the Blu-ray device. So you can really create um, a simple uh, microscope with just your cell phone and the Blu-ray lens. Well, and now there will be a, a quick um, a sh sh uh, cut here. So I'm going to the other project we are um, doing quite a lot here and what you already saw uh, here. So optics now, well, there's, there was a flood of different things now. Um, so how could we simplify that? And um, so in electronics, there is already something. So when I started my apprenticeship as an electrician, I had to start with this year to eventually think about some PCB design, etch it, solder that, and eventually program that. And this whole thing to just make a simple LED bring link took me like two, three weeks. And then uh, there came this thing here, uh, it's called Arduino. And this whole thing takes you just two to three minutes. You have to plug it into USB and install the whole thing. And then you program that. And then this little blink uh, LED here starts blinking. And we were thinking, uh, well, in, in optics, you always have the same kind of arrangement where you have light source, you have an object, you want to uh, visualize that on the camera. So you have an object and uh, objective and a lens. And we were asking ourselves, well, uh, we could also kind of modularize that. Of course, you already have seen that. So we really literally took it as modules in terms of little cubes. So we have, for example, a cube for a light source or a lens or an object. And once you have these cubes, you can start getting really creative with it. For example, uh, we built one device uh, which you can place inside incubators, like biological incubators to eventually um, uh, monitor cells while they're growing. And that's very valuable in terms of uh, high safety biological labs where you can bring stuff in but not out. And also, uh, since it's so cheap, you can um, yeah, have many of those and monitor many different cells at the same time. And um, well, you can again rearrange the whole thing to use your uh, cell phone, for example, to uh, capture the stuff instead of the Raspberry Pi camera. You can create light sheet microscopes or also telescopes. Um, it's really a matter of what you would like to do. And what I um, uh, already emphasized previously, so to make sure that everybody can participate, we uh, created a modular developer kit. So it's inspired by the uh, Google Ara phone, um, which was there, I think, like four or five years ago. And they had the idea to let people um, uh, really uh, let them develop their own uh, modules. And uh, well, unfortunately, it, it died, the project, but we kept it alive in terms of optics. So we have our base, and whoever would like to develop something is free to, to do so. We have already um, have some um, modules you can uh, download and uh, 3D print to, for example, mount lenses, uh, hold mirrors, or add your own ideas. And um, yeah, so this is one uh, sample I just showed. So the typical process is, you have an idea, you draw a rough sketch, then you take the components uh, and print it, you assemble that, put that into your whatever environment, and then you image whatever you would like to do. It's not necessarily a microscopic image. Um, and here, for example, that's some differentiating macrophages over a term, uh, time span of some, some weeks. And I think the following uh, slide is my favorite one because it definitely shows you that there's uh, a low cost alternative for most of the high cost components. For example, if you take a laser source, it can uh, easily cost you some uh, 10,000 euro or roughly dollar. Um, but depending on the purpose you would like to use it for, you can also get that for really like a, um, a very low fraction of the price, say like 50 euro or dollar. And um, another very good example is this optical pickup, which uh, you can use for fiber coupling. Whereas a professional one really costs you like more than 1,000 times more. So, and um, of course, it comes at a price of uh, missing documentation, but I think the open source and open hardware community really, uh, yeah, is really valuable there in the sense. I think uh, that's a good point to st uh, stop here. So everything you found here, um, like the UC2, Cellstom, I skipped in most portions, but you can find that online, it's open source. And I think um, the more people 
uh, are involved here, the better the project will be in the end. And so uh, I hope with this that you see too. And <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, if you have any questions um, going beyond the scope of this thing, I would be very happy to answer them uh, in, uh, yeah, uh, ask me anything or teach me anything section later. <laughs> Yeah, so for a few comments, and I think one of the threads was this is all a prelude to uh, both the Teach Me Anything session and especially the certain sets of cards that you can all print for some of you who do have 3D printers as well. And I think maybe, Benedict, one thread that we might want to do is uh, for the folks who do have 3D printers before the Teach Me Anything session, they could try printing some of those parts. So mm. folks can better understand the That's limitations cool. of what resolution printer is needed for what level of alignment. So you should mm -hmm. just choose a few test pieces that they can print. And I Actually, know several you, of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. If you go to the UC2 GitHub, there's a section called tutorials and there it takes you from the beginning Printing your first cube, your first base plate, assembling it, putting inside a lens, playing with a lens, and going on. You can always skip the stuff that sounds too easy for the more complicated, but to get like a hands-on experience and a feel for it, what, what is possible and how it is to work with it, I think it's nice to start with the first experiments, the lenses, telescopes, a simple microscope, and there's already, that's already something tutorials, yes. And... Da, da, da. There's also some background for someone who's interested. And for the tutorials, for some, we already have videos. And for, the, for all of them, uh, we have step-by-step -step tutorials on how to build it, how to use it. I think that's a good way to start if yeah. you want to be a user. Yeah, and I think it would be valuable for giving people time to make sure that they're printed. Uh, because you know, the first time you're building something, and especially with people with different printers, uh, it would actually be very valuable to just do the exact same experiment all together on those exact Actually, it would be super valuable to me if you really build it and send some feedback, any feedback, file an issue in GitHub that nothing works. I'll be very happy for that. So feedback <laughs> is always welcome. That's the whole point, yeah. Um, okay, so I think we're roughly out of time. One thread that we'll do is Benedict will post that PDF online somewhere so people have access to that PDF. And mm -hmm. I think I just want to emphasize this is the tip of the iceberg in terms of how fun optics is. <laughs> uh, and historically, there is a lot of sense of play associated with optics, which sometimes the way it's presented and taught is really formal that you really have to first dive in into a mathematical formulation before. But most people wondered what they were seeing and then develop much, much of this formulation. So for some of you who have never had this chance before, just spend the time, look around your world, identify just like we did with paper. One fun thing for this assignment would be is identify one optical phenomena that you do not understand. And then in the teach me sessions or in the future sessions, we will try to walk through to how do you go about understanding? So it could be something that you see uh, but try using your own personal experience to digest this material. And what you heard are just some very basic principles that can explain majority of optics. So it would be very valuable to turn this around as a table. And before the Teach Me Anything session, people make a list of one optical phenomena that they have seen that they don't understand. And then, of course, many projects are actually using optical components. So then we'll dive in on uh, literally thinking about uh, in a much more detail uh, of how to break those projects down. Uh, any last minute comments and questions from uh, students? Uh, do you know, Benedict, when you're thinking of doing the Teach Me Anything session? But I think I would uh, wait for some feedback from the people so that yeah. I can uh, guide. I would, or I I would at like least delay it by a week, week or so, so people have had the chance to print some parts. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, okay, so we'll follow up uh, on Thursday on 
some of the applications of optics and we'll close with uh, where uh, optics is scaling uh, in terms of thinking about manufacturing side of the story as well. Uh, and one of the threads that we'll do is uh, this week, we'll also follow up on office hours. Uh, and then I think, yeah, I just wanna say Benedict and Barbara, thank you so much. Uh, you know, it's very obvious, I don't have to say this, but your passion for optics shows just mm -hmm. like for many of us who've been doing this for a while, it's extremely important uh, to take the time and share our joy with a broad group of people. So I just wanna thank you personally for this. And what we'll end up doing is, uh, this is sort of the opening doors for a lot to come. Because if people start applying these sets of principles, there is hundreds and thousands of devices that we could all put together. Exactly, uh, yeah. So on that note, we'll say bye. Uh, <laughs> and we will see you all on Thursday and in the office hours. <laughs> all so, right, thank you very much. It was fun. <laughs> yeah, if <laughs> people much. want to yeah. unmute themselves, uh, they can all say quinine or quin. Quinin. Uh, so Tyler, <laughs> can you unmute everybody as a thank you for Benedict and Barbara? Did it. <laughs> okay, so you yeah, now. Just say thank you for whatever we were supposed to say, quinine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. See you all. Bye.